better. Can you see that? Yeah. What, was white on black, wor it was worse, right? Yeah. It's easier to read black on white? Okay. All right. Uh, oh, we're not in 1 Corinthians 14, although that's a good, good thing to read too. But we're in Ezekiel 33. Just as a recap, recap, uh, remember this, this, this chapter serves as a transition, all right, between really what's have been mostly oracles of judgment against, broadly speaking, Judah, then Jerusalem, um, also the other nations. You remember some of the other nations. The last of them uh, was Egypt. Remember all the oracles of judgment against Egypt. All right, then we have a transition. And we had the watchman, um, which th we said this, it's kind of a transition, but it's also a recap. You see this often in the Bible. Um, so you do a whole, you'll have a whole sequence of things that need to be said. And then you kind of circle back to the beginning. And let, okay, let's repeat what we said. Back, let's get back to where we started, right? And then go from there again, but now in a different direction. Right? So in a way, what happened in chapter 33, you'll, we saw a lot of parallels here. Uh, I probably told you on the sheet from last time. Chapter 3, this looks like, um, like the call of Ezekiel in chapter 3. Okay, just to recap. That's pretty easy to remember, right? Chapter 33 is like chapter 3, right? 30 chapters later. And then there was an oracle at the end, um, verse 12 through, no, 20. This one, here's the transition, because the transition point takes pl is, the, is the fall of Jerusalem. And we've been talking about how Jerusalem is going to fall for a long time. All right, and now Jerusalem falls. How do we know it fell? Because a messenger has come and has, as you do when you conquer a land, you always leave somebody alive so that others can find out about it, right? So they send him back to Babylon um, to say... Well, actually, in this case, Babylon conquered Jerusalem, so of course they're going to tell you. So what Ezekiel has been foretelling for, how long did we figure? It's been years at least, right? Yeah, like four years? Three and a half years? We did the math last time. Anybody remember? No, okay. Well, whatever. Uh, for, for years. Now it's been fulfilled. Ah, which is very helpful when it comes to prophecy, isn't it? It's like, well, if the prophet was right about this thing... Maybe they're right about other things too, right? Yeah. And um, by the way, this is, uh, if, you want, if you want to verify the words of my mouth, um, go listen to uh, Pastor Riley and I um, talking in, did I tell? Just go, or back in, uh, starting in about October of 2019 into our episodes into early 2021, January and February. They're like, wait a minute, how did they know what was happening? before it happened, right? Because COVID didn't start till March 30th. No, we were talking about it in December, November, December. So, uh, especially in January. So I guess you could say, well, pastor was right about COVID. Maybe he's right about other things too. I don't know, if that helps. I, it, that's not how you're supposed to confirm my word, right? Is what he says, what God's word says, right? All right, so. Um, but in this case, with prophetic word, uh, it is essential that Jerusalem fall. All right, and then we talked about how there's a repetition from chapter 18, and there was a very important word. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, oh, we haven't gotten that far yet. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Where's the word that I wanted? Oh, yeah, here it is. Nope. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yet the children of your people say, the word of the Lord is not fair. That sounds like the sermon today. Oh, why have you forsaken us? Uh, but it is their way which is not fair. You know, it's your own fault. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. Right? But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Turn to me, believe. Right? Jesus says, and, or uh, the prophet would say, in returning, you find rest, right? Come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? You shall live, right, by turning to what is right. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his ways. And then right before that, remember this famous setting, which is always helpful to see the context. Uh, where was it? Oh, I didn't go far enough. Ah, 
It's basically the same thing, actually, before. Where was the bit about turn from his wickedness and live? Yeah, it's right there, right? When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, give him back what he's stolen, walks in my statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live and not die. None of the sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. So you'll note that in the Christian church, um, we make a, a, a strong emphasis on regular, consistent attendance to God's word and his sacrament. All right? And this is the reason why. Most people have it backwards. They think... They basically have a theology like that of uh, the Synod of Dort, which was a Reformed Synod, that said, once saved, always saved. Have you heard that before? You know, this is how probably even family members, you know, treat baptism. Well, I'm baptized, so I, I, can't, I can't die. Jesus saved me. Like, yes, if you remain in the faith given to you in baptism, but if you deny your baptism, if you live contrary to it, if you continue in, in unrepentant sin, Baptism is supposed to lead you back into forgiveness daily and richly. So by denying the baptism that you were given, now you're in peril of, or you're in peril of death, damnation, eternal judgment. Right? So in a sense, you get this all from Jesus all over the place. And it's the thing, we actually hate it, is that it's basically, it's not how you start, it's actually how you end. <laughs> right? Think like, everybody's like the thief on the cross. And you're like, yeah, the thief on the cross is a great example of that. Like, well, he was a worthless guy. He was totally worthless. He was a murderer, insurrectionist, whatever, right? A thief, definitely, right? Who else knows? Who, else, who knows what else he did, right? And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in my kingdom. It's like, so, in the, but in the past, people even abused that. And they said, well, I'll put off repentance until I'm dying. And you're like, well, when are you going to, how are you know, going to know a death is near? Sometimes you know, uh, and sometimes you don't, right? It comes suddenly. Um, died suddenly, the hashtag, right? Died suddenly. Uh, so then, no. when I've heard it said that um, someone who is dying repents at mm -hmm. point, yeah. they are totally and then we'll get to that. Yeah. That yeah, absolved, forgiven. That doesn't mean they don't have consequences for what they did. They still bear that. Right? Yeah. They always bear that in life, but not in eternity. No, it's forgiven. Right, repent and live. That's it. That's always the promise. Right? Right, I'll put it off, except, except no one knows the day or the hour. Right. What, what does that even mean? Right, right. Yeah, you, but we can't, we can't do anything about hypocrisy. Because I can't, I can't read your heart. I can only hear it, listen to what you say. Yeah. Yeah, I can only look to what you do and say. I don't really actually, you know, you say, I'm sorry. I'm like, well, are you really sorry? But God knows. Yeah. But God knows. Correct. Right. And if you aren't repentant, he's going to keep calling you to repentance. Right. And if you are repentant, he's going to keep calling you to repentance. The point is, is like, there's, there is no place to putting off for tomorrow what, what, what should be done today. Right. To confess one's sins and be forgiven. Every morning, <laughs> confess your sins, be forgiven. Right? And trust and live in that, not in like, well, I can put it off for a little bit because maybe, or I'm already been forgiven, but I don't have any need for forgiveness today anymore, right? Yeah, that's weird too. Yeah. Well, I didn't realize when I was speaking to like some evangelical friends on mm -hmm. conversations, I didn't realize that they think that when you ask him, into your heart or whatever, yep. and then you ask for forgiveness. That's the only time you have to be repentant. Yeah. Or Correct. Right? Yep. I didn't know that. Yeah. From then on, it's your project. But you, I, I said, we ask for forgiveness daily. And they said, oh, no. Well, he came and did it once. Why do you keep doing it? Right. Yeah. So this is the distinction, um, the right distinction to make from God's word. Uh, the technical terms are justification and sanctification. All right. So they're correct in regards to justification. Once saved, always saved. Jesus died once for the sins of the whole world, for your sins and my sins. You don't need to die again, or he doesn't need to die again for you, right? Any more than you need to be baptized again. That was your death and resurrection, okay? So that's justification. Um, sanctification is the ongoing delivery of that forgiveness and living in that forgiveness, which God works by the Holy Spirit, right? And, and that also requires confession and absolution, returning to one's baptism, being absolved again. As, as Luther reminds us, the old Adam clings to us like, I uh, can't believe you're wearing those tall socks, Hester. 
tights. Oh, they look like heavy tights. Um, what did I say? Luther said, the old Adam clings to us like a, clings around our necks, right? Or he says he's a damn good swimmer, right? That's why daily drowning and rising is what Paul describes and is quoted in the catechism. That's the life of, the sanctifi- of sanctification, being kept in holiness, being kept for- in the forgiveness of sins. So in one sense, they're correct. In another sense, they're wrong. Yeah. Um, of course, they, sometimes some of them will flip it the other way and they'll say, no, 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 no. There's sanctification, then justification. What? No, first you do, you start amending your life and you start trying to live according to God's commands. And then, then the Holy Spirit will work to you to say, now I believe. And then you have the, the altar call, the sinner's prayer, the, uh, and then you, maybe you're baptized, right? We have a teacher that turns out it does not believe in infant baptism, one of our new teachers. So that's going to be fun because that's the problem. It's like everything is about being sanctified your work until you get to the point where finally God saves you. You're like, well, wait a minute. Didn't he die for you before the foundation of the world? Hasn't he already saved you? So then what's, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Receive it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, you can, you can uh, argue with them from the, from the basis on this text, right? Um, turn from your wickedness and live. That's the point. All right. So then Jerusalem fell. And then his mouth was opened, and he was no longer mute. All right, and then we can talk about the next part. I think this is where we left off. Yep. So let's read, I guess, it's two oracles, one that's long, one that's short. So let's read the first oracle. That would be 23 through 30. You can read it. I can read it. It doesn't matter. You want me to read it? Okay, I'm going to read it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, though they who inhabit those ruins in in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say to them, apparently there's messengers that are going back and forth, right? Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, You eat meat with blood, you lift up your eyes toward idols and shed blood. Should you possess the land, you rely on your sword, you commit abominations, and you defile one another's wives. Should you then possess the land? That's a rhetorical question. (laughs) Say thus to them, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely those who are in the ruins shall fall by the sword, and the one who is in the open field I will give to the beast to be devoured, and those who are in the strongholds and caves shall die of pestilence. For I will make the land most desolate. Her arrogant strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass through. And then as we've seen at the end of every oracle, pretty much, then they shall know that I am the Lord, when I have made the land most desolate because of their abominations which they have committed. All right, so there, there's to your point, Vicky. God knows their heart. They're making a claim to this land, right? We deserve it because we, there's, well, there's so many of us and we're already here and we didn't get sent into ex- exile. And then he has a few judgments against them because he knows what they're doing and he knows their heart. All right. It is interesting the way that in this oracle, the Lord relays to Ezekiel what's happening back in Jerusalem. So the messenger here is actually the Lord saying, here's what they're saying. I don't know if we've seen that before, but that is interesting. All right. Uh, Where's my sheet? All right. Notice, too, he starts with son of man. If you've been uh, paying attention in the daily prayer from Matthew, those last few chapters, guess who keeps calling himself the son of man? Yeah. So that's Jesus speaking as prophet. Right. But also son of man is connected to Daniel 7 and 9. So it's referring to the Messiah as well. So it's both a title of Messiah, but also title of the prophet. All right. Of the apocalyptic prophet, really. That's why he especially latches on to son of man when it's, par- when it's parables or prophecies of judgment against Jerusalem. Like you heard last Sunday in church. The abomination of desolations in the holy place. Let the reader understand. You know what he's talking about, right? I, don't, I, don't, I didn't actually listen to the whole sermon. I don't know if he explained it. <laughs> seems like every year I miss that Sunday. Anyway. All right. Um, So they're in the ruins of Israel. And here's what they're saying. 
Ezekiel. Abraham was only one, and he inherited the land. But we are many. The land has been given to us as a possession. How audacious a statement. You see what they're saying? Well, there's many of us, and Abraham was only one. And he, he got a whole land. So look at all of us. We should get even more. Right? Survival of the fittest, I wrote on the sheet. Like Darwinian uh, materialism. All right. But the problem is, who gave them the land? God did. Did they deserve it? No. Did Abraham deserve it? No. God called him out of unbelief into belief. Right? Did God give it to Abraham immediately? No. Actually, and even then, he took Abraham's grandson, Jacob, right? Yeah, grandson, Jacob, and took Jacob and his whole family into exile for 400 years before they got returned to it again. Teaching them again, do they, do they have that land by right or by gift? You see? Yeah. So that, these, these folks, this is the most arrogant statement you can possibly make. To God, right? We deserve this. We've earned it. Can you earn an inheritance? Well, maybe you can. <laughs> you could be the favorite son, right? The one who, you know, the one who does all the work on the farm. So, of course, he's the one that gets the farm, right? Yeah. Oh. Wait a minute, that was the older son with the prodigal son, wasn't it? Yeah, oops. Nope, Can't, you don't deserve inheritance. Inheritance is a gift, all right? Uh, but we are many, the land is given to us as a possession. All right, so then the Lord has six judgments against them, right? Um, six specific transgressions. Was there something else I was going to mention? I'm going fast. Yeah, we should probably, before we do that, let's talk about uh, what's on the sheet? Uh, oh, who is it that's... They're, they're claiming the land as a possession. They currently don't possess it. The Babylonians do. But it also seems as if there's a counterclaim against it. And I suggest to you that this is the Edomites. We've met the Edomites back in chapter 18, I think it was. I wrote it down. No, 35. We will meet the Edomites. 35, sorry. Um, and then by the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, about 150 years later... The Edomites are called the Idumeans. Have you heard of them? The Idumeans. They kind of changed their name. Right? This is who the Herods come from. The Herods are Edomites. Yeah. Edom being who? Edom's another name for Esau. That's right, Jacob's brother. So this is all distant family feud. <laughs> all right. Anyway, they may be making a claim, and you can see that in Ezra and Nehemiah if you want to go read that. Uh, then, look at what I wrote in the second paragraph. Their claim is totally secular, not based on recollection of Yahweh's oath, promise, and covenant given to Abraham. So you remember, like with Abraham, also with Moses. Moses does this repeatedly. But God, you said. Right? Or what will other people say of you if you destroy these people? Right? So Moses is a great example of holding God to his word. Right? You can argue with God, but don't argue on the basis of reason or your ideas about what's right and wrong. Are you with God based upon what he says? Right? But you said, right? These people are not doing that. But you promised this land to Abraham. That's not what they're saying, right? They're just saying, there's a bunch of us, so good luck. Yeah. Um, actually, we've seen this already in Ezekiel, but I know it's been, we took a few weeks off, so we lost our, lost our momentum a little bit. But uh, you especially see this in Jeremiah, that now that the temple's destroyed... It seems as if God doesn't actually even care about that land at all in particular. The only reason why he would care about the land is that he dwells there and his people are gathered there. Same thing with the church, by the way, or a congregation, I should say. He only cares about this place insofar as Christians come and hear his word. If there's no Christians here, God doesn't come here. The spirit just goes, do, 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 goes find, it, find, the, find the Christian somewhere else or gather them somewhere else, right? So, uh, which is kind of, it's kind of like we talked about with baptism. Once saved, always saved, right? Well, as long as we put in some money periodically to the church, it'll be there for us when we need it. Guess what ends up happening? Don knows. Yeah, you're like, well, how did we end up in such a hole? Uh, you weren't here and you weren't contributing, you know? It's like, actually, money is the least important part. The most important part is your presence, actually. Because that's going to govern the rest of your life and how you actually treat the church and treat those who are here. If you're not hearing God's word, don't be surprised that you don't act in accordance with God's word. All right, so that's, that's important. Um, 
So, oh, I even gave you a little note about what I just said. Huh. The survivors, pious sounding appeal to Abraham. They mention Abraham by name, right? But not the promise, not the oath, none of that. It's familiar. Protagonists of any cause will seek some higher moral ground, even appealing to scripture, right? But God says, right? But we could see an example of that in Matthew 4, which is the temptation in the wilderness. Even the devil appeals to scripture. That's not enough, right? Um, it actually... Uh, apart from Christology and then what's called the material principle of soteriology, Augsburg Confession 4 on justification, um, you can bend scripture into all sorts of invalid and nefarious purposes. Right? So just saying, well, God's word says, I've, this happens all the time. People just quote one verse of scripture. This is why in the daily prayer, I always encourage you, and I try to do it frequently, is let's go read the broader context so that we don't misuse that passage. But what I'm telling you here is there's even a bigger um, overarching Mm, necessity in interpreting God's word. Everything must be interpreted according to Christ and his cross. This is what Paul actually asserts when he says we preach nothing but Christ and him crucified. That we understand the whole scripture in light of God the Father sending his son Jesus to die for us to forgive us our sins and thereby to give us life and salvation. If, if you're reading a piece of scripture and it leads you away from faith in that, you're not reading it right. Got it? Now, that seems obvious to you because you're Lutherans, right? Except most Lutherans don't actually believe that either. Or they probably never even heard that, right? That all scripture testifies of Jesus, meaning everything is understood in light of his suffering and death. It doesn't even make sense without it, right? It's like almost unintelligible. Like, why is all this stuff happening if it's not to bring Christ to us, to forgive us? Yes, and to show us our sin, which we've talked about as the alien work of that, the back, backside of it. Um, so that's what they're doing here. They're just pulling a name out of the hat. Well, Abraham inherited a land and not remembering, actually, that was a promise from God and it was given to him. And it was actually contingent on Abraham's faithfulness because it was a covenant. Ah, that's, yeah. And, you have, and so then that's why he reminds them, uh, you haven't been so faithful. <laughs> All right, now we can talk about the six things. You eat meat with blood. Um, so that's, you've heard about this, right? With Leviticus, you have to drain the animal comes up in the Passover every year. We hear about you know, let no blood be in it. And then when you get to Sinai, it's, it's codified that you never eat meat with the blood in it. No, no blood sausage, Germans. Right. In the, no, actually in the New Testament then, with, remember the sheet comes down and Peter sees, yeah, you can eat whatever you want now. Because, because actually the sacrifice has come. It's Christ. That's the reason. Now you can have blood sausage. It's good. Or blood pudding. Is that the other thing? Where you coagulate? Blood what do you? Well, well, okay, fine. It doesn't matter. Okay, right. Whatever you want to call it. I don't. I don't care what you call it. You want to have your coagulated blood soup? That's fine. You know, people do this. I've never had it. I tried it. Well, think about like if you're in the north, like way north. It's very cold. You know, and you got the elk or something. You're gonna eat everything, and you, and. And the, the blood and the fat are actually really good for long-term energy storage, right? That's what they're there in the animal for, to give them, to give them you know, what they need to get through the winter. So that's, yeah, drink the blood. Anyway, don't drink. Vampire people. Uh, this, this is maybe a little bit different, though. I gave you some notes about this. And the problem is, is the translation here. It says, when you eat the meat with the blood, but that's not what it actually says. The preposition is different. It's a different preposition. When you eat over the blood, how did I mark up on the screen? That's strange. Clear cursor, how about that? All right. When you, when you eat over, or what was the other translation I gave you? Upon blood, meat upon blood. All right. Now, the reason they translate with with is because they, it's really hard to figure out what, because there's only two other places where this is done, used, where it says over or under blood. So you're like, okay, what's that all about? So I gave you the citations. Uh, one is Leviticus 19, where apparently in ancient Canaanite religions, you've got, uh, they're, they're, Don Kleinig talks about this in his Leviticus commentary. They, they would actually drain the blood of the animal into a, into a hole in the ground, and they would, then they would, cook, they would cook next to that. And there was like some kind of pious thing, like you would, eat, you would actually consume it while leaning over this pool of blood. 
Not a lot of evidence, but there's some on that. But in the, in the, in the Near East, meaning like Babylon, lots of documentation of blood rituals connected to, to meat in the in pagan uh, sacrifices. And uh, uh, do I give you an example of that? I don't even know if I talked about it. Oh, here it is. I just, I just wrote it out. I didn't give you a citation. It's probably referring to some sort of pagan communion meal in which the participants ate meat whose blood is poured out in order to attract gins. So you don't rub the lamp. Genie. We call them genies, but gins. Yeah. Uh, so you don't rub the lamp, but actually it's eating over the blood. Then that would cause the jinn to come and give them knowledge of the future, right? Basically a demon? Hmm? Yeah. That's how uh, Neil Gaiman does it in American Gods, actually. In the TV show, not in the book. Yeah, there's a jinn. Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah, he's very, yeah, it's, it's disturbing. Disturbing. All right, so that's the first one. Um, there's probably more that could be said. I gave you a citation from 1 Samuel 14. So maybe we should look at that, because I say it's in view, but it's not on your screen, so how is it in view? That's right. Little chuckle. That's all right. Pastor's not that funny. All right, so here we go. Now, they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Aizjalan, so the people were very faint. All right, oh, we're so hungry. This is always the problem, isn't it? This is when the kids misbehave, too. Keep them fed so they don't get cranky. And then they ask for, then things get worse, right? They were very faint, so the people rushed on the spoil of, of Michmash and took sheep, oxen, and calves and slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. And here again, oh, they even give you a note. Ah, but it's over under. Then they told Saul, saying, Look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. So it's implied, but it's pretty clear that these were the sheep, oxen, and calves that were used for ritual sacrifice to, who's the Philistine god, probably? I mean, they had Baal and Asherah, but it also, uh, remember with Samson, what was the name of the temple? Dagon, right? The big fish god? He's got, he's got a big fish head. They were fishermen, so of course your god's going to have a fish head. You worship the thing you eat, right? Not funny. Okay, fine. Fine. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out. Okay, uh, let's see. So, that's the first abomination. Oh, no, the first uh, sin. The second one, you lift up your eyes toward your sanitized idols. But remember, what are these? What kind of idols are these? What did we call them? Yeah. What? Fecal deities. Very good. Fecal deities. All right. So those, got to, those came back again. That's fun. And then shed blood. Um, that's obvious. That's murder, right? Yeah. Okay, so they eat pagan sacrifices. They have pagan Id idols, and they murder. Should you then possess the land? Answer? You violated the covenant. The land's not yours, right? Uh, and then three more. You rely on your sword. Uh, stand by your sword, maybe? Could translate it that way. You commit abominations, which that's pretty universal translation, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then this last one, you defile one another's wives. That's actually just, you know, adult. that's the worst kind of adultery, because it's probably rape, actually. Should you then possess the land? Right, so if you want to claim that you deserve the land, not on the basis of promise, but on the basis of, like, right, that you deserve it by right, well, then how do you reconcile that with your behavior? See what I mean? Yeah. All right. Uh, by the way, this abominations is an interesting, is an interesting word. Um, it can mean comp comprehensive, but we've already had it used in a, like all like kind of, I don't know, whatever is contrary to God's word. But back in Ezekiel 22, we had the word used in another context. If you men uncover their father's nakedness, if you've... In you, they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Oh, you forgot this part, right? Put this out of your mind, right? And another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you, they take bribes to shed blood. You take usury and increase. You have made profit from your neighbor's extortion. You've forgotten me. Yeah, uh, whew, that's kind of rough. But there's that word. And notice what it's in the context with. 
again, adultery, but also with all sorts of other terrible sexual sin. So in the New Testament, what's interesting, um, not the same word because New Testament's in Greek, but the, ana- the analogy is actually for homosexual behavior. So that's included here too. Um, and that actually helps. This, this is a brilliant insight. So you ready? You're going to get one today. Just one brilliant insight. I hope you're ready. All right. This will explain to you why. Now, now you will finally understand what, what you've always been confused about. Or maybe it's just Pastor who's never known what's going on in this text. In 1 Corinthians chapter, um, what did I say? Six. Yep, six. You've always wondered, how could he make such an assertion? All right. That chair doesn't like you to rock it that much. All right. Um, By the way, all the things that he says about suing brethren and and usury with brethren, we saw those back in Ezekiel 22 in the context of sexual morality. And then look at what he says here. Uh, We'll start in verse 7. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to the law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? This is the hardest thing for Christians to learn. Christian institutions like churches and schools to learn is that we actually allow ourselves to be violated and cheated and stolen from <laughs> because, because we're actually to be generous even with those who hate us. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. There's no run, way to run a business. It isn't. I don't know what this means for a Christian business owner. But anyway, because uh, it's not on your conscience. It's on their, theirs, right? Yeah. That doesn't mean you can't inform their conscience. They're saying, what you're doing to me is wrong. All right, well, anyway. Um, No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So see that expression? The unrighteous will not inherit. What were we just talking about? We, We deserve the inheritance of this land, right? Yeah. But here it's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. But it's, that's the greater inheritance, not Israel. That parcel of land in Judah that they've fought over for the last <laughs> 6,000 years. Right? Can't even decide who gets to be on the mountain. Um, do not be deceived. Here we are. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, some people translate this away, but it's pretty clear, homosexuals. It's actually catamites. Uh, so what's, what's notable with that um, is that they participate in homosexual behavior. And you, there are people with homosexual desires that live celibate lives by God's grace. Right? That's, they're not being rejected here. We're talking about those who engage in the behavior and say it's, God's pleased with it. Uh, sodomites, that's pretty apparent what that's about. If you read the story of Sodom, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm always like, like, wait a minute. How can you say they don't get to have the inheritance? It's like, I thought anybody, anything could be forgiven. It actually goes back, to, it goes back to the prophetic word from Ezekiel, would be my suggestion, where he says, that's the claim they're making, that we deserve to inherit, but they're living this kind of, uh, well, both abominations and defiling one another's wives. Should you inherit, possess the land? And the answer is no, right? Only through the forgiveness of sins in Christ's name. Only in the covering of Jesus' blood. All right, it's getting warm. Let's keep going. <laughs> Say thus to them, thus says the Lord God, I, as surely, or as I live, surely those who are in the ruins, all right, so now we have judgment against them. They don't deserve it. They haven't earned it. Um, it's not for them. And so then we have, we have three kinds of death being brought upon them. One is the sword. One is the beast. Dorothy, And the other is a pestilence or plague. In other words, no one escapes. If the sword doesn't get you, the beast will, right? If you flee the city, the beasts are going to get you in the field. And if you get, even if the beasts spare you, the plague will get you, right? Why? What's the, what's the actual issue here? It's not that they don't, does, that God doesn't want them to live, but it cannot be on the basis of them deserving it or having earned it, or being just numerous, right? It has to be on the basis of, Lord, we have sinned. Please forgive us. Okay. Um, Yeah. 
Right? Can he forget their abominations? Can he forgive those? Sure he can. Right. They're not interested in that. They want to continue in them. All right. So that's the first oracle. That's the longer of the two. That has to do with the people back in exile, or who never were put into exile. And it is clear from here and elsewhere in Ezekiel, those who don't go into exile don't get to come back. It's only those who go into the exile that come back, which is a repeated story in the Bible, right? It's only through death and resurrection. So, or exile and returning. Or you can think of the prodigal son as a, as a good example of that too, where the father sends him away. Well, he wants to go away. The father says go, and he knows that that will, that, that's the means or the method by which the father then calls him to repentance, to recognize his rebellion and his sin. And then, and then there's absolution, of course. All right. Whew, that's fun. Anybody inspired by air conditioning for church yet? You're checking on it right now on your phone? <laughs> Get us a quote. All right. Um, by the way, I was thinking about our service time thing. I'm just going to say this, and you can all, it's fine, you can all be a part of this conversation. Because we're going to ask at the picnic about whether we should return the service time to 9.30. It seems to me that we've had a number of people that keep requesting a late service. And our confession, and my assertion has long been, if you want to meet at a later time, we can meet at a later time. I don't want to split the church in two, but I think we should just offer it. Because I would, like, I know plenty of people that would rather come at eight for church. It's like, okay, it's two congregations and it's not great, but if the, if, if, yeah, we can try it for a time, just like we tried a different service time a little earlier. Try a, little late, try a late one. You're saying just one service? No, two. Two. Oh, We're early and a late with Bible study in between, really? like you used to do. It seems like a terrible idea. Yeah. We did it before. And it didn't work. Yeah. Right. But they don't believe that. They're like, we'll come to church if it's later. Okay, well. Some people keep saying they don't like the 9 o'clock? Or 9.30, frankly. Really? Hmm. There's too many things to do on the farm. Yeah, we'll do a sunrise. Well, that's my point. All right, anyway, something to think about. Oh, we got a few weeks till the picnic. Think about. Do we just... Because sometimes you have to just do a thing to remember. Yeah, we tried this before and it was terrible. Why are we doing it again? And then you just... Okay, fine. All right, anyway. Third, uh, the second oracle here. As for you, son of man. So there it is again. Now we're going to talk about a different people. The children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses. This is why I go on vacation. So you, you have plenty of opportunity to talk amongst yourself about the pastor when he's not here. All right. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I try not to give you cause to say. Things. I mean, you, it's like, pastor, it's so hot. Why don't you just cut the beard? He might be cooler. I was thinking about that coming out of church today. It's like, that's probably actually a good suggestion. It is pretty warm. Anyway. Let's go on the Harley. I know. There, there was a guy yesterday at the, at the ga- gas station, and I was very envious of his beard. I was like, oh, man, if only. But mine was a little nicer until Naomi ripped a whole chunk out of it at the hospital. Oh. Yeah, that was a pleasant experience. I was, we- I was weeping. <laughs> it hurt so bad. <laughs> this is her thing when she gets really mad. That's how she gets your attention. Uh, it's unfor- fortunately, though, it also gets her attention. But, yeah, it's not the right way to deal with that kind of behavior. She, wasn't, she did not want to be there. All right. Uh, well, that's true. But also she'd been fasting for, like, 12 hours at that point. Yeah, right. right. And you try to explain to a nonverbal kid that you can't eat because you have to sit here in the waiting room watching commercials on TV for food. Yeah. <laughs> so stupid. All right, we got to, I'm sorry, focus. They speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Come... Please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. All right. So rather than go and listen to the prophet, what do they do? They talk amongst themselves about what the prophet said, which is fine. You can do that. Um, But we'll see what the problem is here with it. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth, they show much love. Um, Translation here has been neutered. We'll get to that but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them. 
which is not, not the day you want. You don't want to be there on that day. When they find out, oh, that's, how, that's what God's word says? Right. Um, yeah, so this is, well, this is the nature of, of the preaching office, not just the prophetic office, is um, I, I actually heard this not that long ago, and it's, it's disturbed me ever since, is that uh, someone said, you know, I'm not going to correct you, Pastor, because, you know, I always understand where you're coming from. I understand where you're coming from. This is what I said publicly. Right? I understand what, I, I, I can understand what you're saying. I just don't agree with it. Like, you, wait a minute. The pastor is not given to speak from his own opinion or perspective. That doesn't mean I don't give you that periodically. Generally in here, though, right? And I usually tell you, hey, this is just my opinion, but... Uh, no, uh, this is why I had in the sermon today, you know, that's, uh, you know, the word of the Lord came to me, like Ezekiel, right? The word of the Lord came to me. It's like, if you have an issue with what was said in the sermon, that's, uh, my assertion is that you have a problem with God's word. Now, maybe I spoke incorrectly, and that's where I need my, I need you to correct me, right? But show me, this is not what God's word says. It's like, this is not an opinion. I, I don't speak from opinion. There's no point in me speaking from opinion, because there's plenty of people you can listen to who are opinionated. That's how they're approaching Ezekiel. It's like, well, that's, that, that's just your opinion, man, to quote uh, the big Lebowski. I still think that was a power move on John's part. He doesn't even know. Our new, one of our new teachers wore a big Lebowski t-shirt to the first school, day of school meetings. I was like, I didn't tell him that, but it's just like your opinion, man. All right. Uh, hi, do you keep your dress down? That's inappropriate. So, but what I said, there's, there's a little bit more going on here. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, what, maybe do what I wrote first, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, Yahweh tells the, the prophet what the people are saying about him. With three nearly identical expressions, Yahweh is the talk, or Ezekiel is the talk of the town. Right? And that's all because Jerusalem fell, is my assertion. Does that make sense? Now that, oh, he's been talking about that happening for years. It happened. Maybe we should listen to what he's saying. All right? Well... Listen, but not necessarily do, right? They don't listen to him just grudgingly, if at all, or delegate the chore to the elders. Now the fulfillment of his basic prophecy of the fall of Jerusalem has at least convinced them that Yahweh is present and active. And yet all they talk about is, this is where the translation isn't helpful. With their mouth, they show much love, and with their hearts, they pursue their own gain. Right? Pursue their own gain is obviously money, right? Right? But with their mouth, they show much love. Um, a more literate tra- literal translation uh, would be, I gotta find it here. With their, they use, they prefer to use their mouths for obscene talk, and their heart pursues illicit profits, illicit profits, obscene talk, right? Obscenities, sexual obscenities. We'll see that in the context of what's coming after this. Which is just interesting. All, you, all you talk about at church is sex and money, right? <laughs> Have you heard that complaint before? Evangelical churches get it all the time because they actually do. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that actually that yeah, whole bottom mm-hmm. section reminds me of modern Western Christianity, yeah. like progressive Christianity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's inverted. Really. That's all they talk about. Yeah, whether it's whether it's the liberal progressive types, right. or it's the health, wealth, and prosperity people. Yes. Right. It's all about just getting ahead in life. Yeah. Some of them, I was so listening. Right. It's not. No, it's not sacrifice. Love is sacrifice. Yeah. So, so they, they listen, but they don't do it. Or if they listen, they, they use it as an excuse or a cover for their own desire for only just, just all the things that have to do with power. Wealth and sex are largely the two things. If you want to know how politicians get controlled, <laughs> that's how they're controlled is through sex and power. Right. Sometimes blackmail, sex blackmail, but yeah, anyway. We've got tapes on you. Ooh, okay, I'll do what you tell me. Right. At least that's how the CIA works. Not my opinion, documented. Sure. <laughs> True story. All right. What do you think Epstein was all about? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, but we would say this is kind of just basic hypocrisy, but worse. I think it's worse than basic. Basic hypocrisy is they listen, but they don't do it. Right? You talk about love all the time in the church, but you don't show it. Right? That would be the easy one. To, to refer to the sermon. Um, but this is even like worse. I mean, they're basically living like Babylonians. 
even though they're listening, right? Just straight up pagans, all right? Indeed, you are to them as a, this is just so incredible. Speaking of uh, progressive or evangelical, or uh, excuse me, like, you know, big, band, big box churches. You play a lovely song who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. By the way, this lovely song, that, that's not a great uh, translation either because it's connected to this. It's the same word. So with all of your uh, obscene talk and now with your obscene singing, this is like love songs. You might say uh, erotic songs, actually. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard all the praise music that some of our churches even sing about how basically, you know, it's not Jesus is my friend or he's my shepherd or he's my Lord, but it's Jesus is my boyfriend, basically. Yeah, because lots of talk about love, but not love as in Jesus gave his life to save you from your sins, but love is in a terms, it's all emotive. Everything's emotive. It's this kind of music. Now, um, this is worth noting. There's a whole bunch I wrote on here about this. I don't, we don't have to cover it all. Um, it doesn't matter how many times you sing something that's wrong. It's still wrong. Three times zero is zero is what I put on there. But um, when we sing, actually, I would say it this way. When the prophets sing, which the prophets do sing, Moses sang, Isaiah sang, Isaiah 5. There's others. I just gave you some of the examples. So when the prophets sing the oracles, this is why they were written in poetry, by the way. We just don't have the music. Um, when they sang, they did not sing for purely emotive purposes. Now, music has that gift, is that it can inspire the emotion, right? So you can sing of Jesus' blood and merit, and, you know, it can bring you to tears. It's true, right? Especially if, you, if you're especially been convicted by your sins and you need that word, hear that word of forgiveness in song. So that's one of the, that's the gift of music. But the words, just like with Ezekiel, it's not just about hearing the lovely music. It's hearing what he's saying, right? The words are what really, and they're not listening to what he's saying. They just love his voice. Maybe, or even if it's not music, even if you want to take this as a metaphor, he's such a brilliant speaker. And I always feel empowered after I leave or something like that, right? Or he really inspired me. And then Ezekiel's question would be to do what? Well, I feel better about myself. Okay. Did anything change, really? Well, I feel better. Well, I don't, honestly, I don't, you know, Ezekiel would say this. Maybe I would too. Uh, I don't really care about your feelings. <laughs> what do you believe? What do you know? What is true? Right? Now, this is the problem with, with having a male-only pastorate. <laughs> is that, I'm sorry, there are women in the room. You understand. You do care about how it makes you feel. Uh, men t- typically just don't care that much about your feelings. I'm sorry. If, that, if you haven't experienced that, you probably have. Bobby's laughing. Okay, good. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be, laugh about it a little bit, but, it, but there's some truth to it. Um, and so what the brilliance of, of great hymns is that they say something, they give you something, right, that's real and true and, and co- a confession of God's word, and they're joined to beautiful music that moves the emotion, right? And they do both things. But to sing songs that move the emotion but say nothing, or even worse, say nothing true, um, I just don't have time for it in church. I, and I don't want you to, I don't need you to learn them. Like, there's, right, especially the praise songs, especially the praise songs. Now, there are some exceptions. There's always exceptions to every, every kind of assertion like this. My whole father, my whole father me was to see uh, some other places I've been. Yeah. It's to see men singing them. Father, because it looks cute to me. Well, usually, though, they don't. Well, I've seen, I've seen yeah. men sing them, and it's like, he can't even sing. <laughs> he literally physically can't sing whole songs. No. But when I see him singing, I'm like, I'm like, that doesn't, it doesn't look right to me. It just seems no. weak. And we, and we do have some hymns that are um, intentionally, you know, that speak of the weakness of the flesh or speak of, you know, speak of weakness. Yeah. And we can, but we can say those words with assertion because they're true. Yeah, just right? So that's like the difference. The, the songs you're talking about that are like just the phrases being repeated. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's because they don't, the words actually don't matter. Yeah. That's why you're, now you'd say it's, you repeat them because they do matter. Well, it's, kind of, it's, it's actually a form of mind control. <laughs> right, because it's a mantra. Right, this is how the East works. They get you to repeat a phrase over and over. There are Christians that pray this way too. Say the same thing over and over and over. 
right? And it puts you into a state of mind where you're susceptible. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I want you to think carefully about what we say. This is why the hymns are published for you each week on the back of the Congregation of Prayer. So you have an opportunity. Even if you don't have a hymnal at home, you can, you can Google them, right? Find the, find the words. Read the words, right? Because sometimes it's going to be a little bit of a struggle to get through the music because maybe you're not that familiar with it uh, or the organist plays too fast or the recording plays too fast, usually. <laughs> um, you know, but if you already know the words or you're familiar with them, it'll be easier. But also because we want to get past the point where you're, trying, you're struggling just to say the words to where you're actually able to contemplate the words. Right? So we sing Salvation Unto Us has come probably a dozen times a year. Why? So that you can learn it by heart, and then it can just be, okay, oh, I see how that applies to today's sermon. Oh, I kept, oh that's a reference. You know, and you make the connections right to the, to the day. All right. That'd be an argument for actually learning, singing only a few things, but singing really good things rather than singing a lot of things and not singing anything for comprehension. Because that's what ends up happening here, right? Well, you sound nice, and you play a great instrument. Um, for they hear their words, but they do not do them. All right? But at some point, they're going to learn that maybe we should have been paying attention to what they said, what he said. Um, and uh, hopefully the prophet's still there to speak to you. And God has not taken him away by the Spirit to another place and left you without the word now. And now you're just in regret. Like, where is our preacher? Where is our preacher? So, is there more things I can say about this? <laughs> well, like we said back in chapter... Oh, no, here it is. Yeah, there's all sorts of things about chanting, too. Because um, it has the same effect as singing a hymn. You, you'll see this with the children. I'll say, what are the words of institution? And they'll be like, they're like, uh, I'll say, our Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll be like, but if I go, our Lord Jesus Christ, then they just go. You're like, what? How? But you see, for, mem for memory and for, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that having that melody behind it, or, you know, you, we could do like the Nook Dominus three different ways, probably at this point. Oh, Lord, now let your servant. And you could go, okay, depart in heavenly peace. Yeah, you'd be like, okay, I know what to do. Right, or how we did it today. Sorry. Yeah, it's the chant. It's kind of an Anglican chant version. All right. So that, um, I think there's some applicability more to us on this. Not so much, hopefully not so much the people in, back in Jerusalem with all their abominations, right? Uh, anybody need to confess your abominations? Okay, no. Uh, but more, more like these people. I was like, okay, we have a prophet. We're in exile. We hear him, but... Pastor, those are just a nice opinion. That's, I love how you said that. That was a great sermon. But like, do you take it to heart? Do you do it? Do you actually you know, say, okay, that was the word of God. I need, there's some amendment of life that, that he's called me to here. And God, by his spirit, will work that in you. And that's what's going on here too. All right. Yeah, there's more you could say, but that's probably, you can read it. You've got the handout. Um, and thanks be to God, they had a preacher, right? And that's the point. And they wouldn't know what they've lost until it's gone. Isn't that a song? That's a song. All right. So um, the next chapter we're not going to read today. But that one I think we're going to have to break up into parts as well. Because we have to talk about sheep and shepherds. Uh, but this is one of those chief texts, chapter 34, that will really... Um, we do hear this. We hear a section of this in our le lectionary. So if you come to church every week, you've probably heard it. But um, if we read the whole context, you'll find that it really puts some meat on the bones when it comes to Jesus calling himself the good shepherd and not the bad shepherd. Is it good and bad, right? Isn't that how he does it? The shepherd, the good one? But the bad shepherd, well, he doesn't say the bad shepherd, the hired hand. What do hired hands, who are the hired hands he's talking about? Right? The irresponsible shepherds of Israel. So this will help you understand that when we get to that. Uh, shepherd language from Jesus. All right. Uh, Lord be with you. Uh, wish me uh, safe travel. It uh, should be fine. I've already been to Nebraska and back in two days, so why not go to Cincinnati too? I feel I'm like a long hauler now. I'm doing these, these eight-hour driving days.